Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy Lord, you are indeed holy. And we always seek and, and are, are, are you, we seek you. And we're amazed, as the Apostle Paul told us, that you are in us. Help us to, to understand that better and understand what it is you want from us and for us, for ourselves and for the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thou shalt not murder. What could be more straightforward and honestly more obvious than that? And so maybe one approach to the sermon today, you could at least argue this, would be to simply read the commandment and say, and that's the end of it, and just say, Amen. Friends, if it was that obvious, why would God go to the trouble of commanding us not to murder? If it was that straightforward, why would the second story in the entire Bible, the story of Cain and Abel, why would that be the second story, a story that is really a stark warning about human capacity, not only to murder, but also the anger underneath that might cause it? God knows us. God knows humanity, and God knows the trouble we can get into. Hence, the sixth commandment. But still, come on. This commandment, it's pretty obvious. It's pretty simple, pretty obvious. Of course, society would fall apart if we were able to take the life of another human being whenever we wanted to and for whatever reason. Murder is bad. Don't do it. End of sermon. Amen. But wait a second. I actually do have a few questions, and I'm sure you do as well. Like, why is it that the King James Version says, thou shalt not kill? Which is it, kill or murder? They are not the same. Scholars and theologians have been debating that for mm, roughly 3,000 years, basically since Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments to deliver to the Israelites when they just fled from Egypt. Is it kill or murder? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. If it's kill, which implies any kind of killing and of anything, anyone, then I have to admit, I'm confused. Because the Old Testament speaks about a lot of killings and condones taking life in certain circumstances. And even if we do assume it's murder, as our translation today says, and most modern translations say that, and based on my own analysis, I agree. But if we say, and so if we say it's murder, thou shalt not murder, then why does God, if you go to the story of Cain and Abel, why does God allow Cain, the original murderer, right at the beginning of the Bible, the murderer of his brother Abel, why does God allow Cain to go free, and then just a few chapters later, talk about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. There are plenty of questions that get raised by this commandment, by this simple commandment. Questions that are not easily answered and leave room for interpretation including controversial topics, hot-button topics that we often can disagree over, headline-making topics, including recent headlines about the Supreme Court cases, George Floyd, the fighting in the Holy Land, the shootings in San Jose. The implications of this commandment are far from simple, in part because there is plenty that even, even well-intentioned people will disagree over, sometimes vehemently, which is why each of us need to be given some bandwidth 
to reflect and draw our own conclusions about the implications. But still, come on, with all of that, at a most basic level, and you'll be glad to hear this, we, we still might wonder, what does this commandment really have to do with how I live my life personally? What does it have to do with me? After all, I, you'll be glad to hear this, I think I'm highly unlikely to want to murder someone. Again, maybe the sermon could be as simple as, do not do it, amen. Well, apparently, Jesus doesn't think that's the end of the story. Jesus doesn't see it quite that simply. It's important to acknowledge here that in a way, this sixth commandment sets a very low bar. If all I have to do is comply, to comply with it is not to murder, well then, I don't think I can just check that box and let's move on to the seventh commandment because I think I'm pretty safe in that respect. And so what more can we learn here? What more do we need to learn here? Is there more? The answer from Jesus and from Paul is absolutely yes. As is often the case, what Jesus is doing is he's raising the bar. He's raising the bar. He prompts us to a higher standard. Jesus, in our reading, and it's from the Sermon on the Mount, is not content to leave it at simply, don't murder. He insists instead on looking at the source of the problem, and he insists that we go inside, we go into our hearts and reflect. Because Jesus, God, walking in our shoes, fully understands the anger that can cause so many problems that we human beings have in our relationships, individual and societal. Jesus does this perhaps with a little bit of hyperbole, but he says that we need to tend to our anger before it grows into a problem. Jesus is worried. He's worried. With plenty of evidence, beginning back with the old Cain and Abel story and continuing through to today. And because of that, we need these words. We need the commandment and we need Jesus warning us about he says it about the insults to our, that we do to our brothers and sisters. And we need Jesus warning us that we really need to reconcile without delay. He puts urgency into this to resolve our differences as soon as possible. And the, what he's talking about in that reading basically is do it before you even go to church. Jesus' words of reconciliation, that's what they are, words of reconciliation, they seem especially important they feel, to me, especially important today when people often eagerly share their anger in many ways and the ability to do it online increases the chance of that anger going viral. And as this Sermon on the Mount continues, as Jesus continues in his great sermon, he continues with the same message of reconciliation. And he raises the bar again, these challenging words meant to cool off anger, same objective, turn the other cheek, love your enemy, do unto others as we would have them do unto us. After that, in the great story of Cain and Abel, after Cain has done the evil deed, God confronts him asks, where is your brother? Where is Abel? And Cain pretty defensively responds by asking, am I my brother's keeper? I think our reading and the entire Sermon on the Mount, in those readings and the entire Sermon on the Mount and, and arguably in Jesus' entire ministry, 
he directly answers that question. Yes, yes, we are our brother's keepers, including brothers and sisters we disagree with, and even more so, brothers and sisters we're angry with. The Apostle Paul picks up the same theme. The truth is he picks it up throughout his letters, all of them. But especially in the letters that he wrote to the church at Corinth. Multiple letters, several of which are probably included in, in what we call 2 Corinthians, our reading from today. He was writing to the church in Corinth, city, that he, the church that he founded in a great prosperous city, a church with remarkable divisions and anger between the members. And in these letters to the Corinthian church, Paul frequently calls for unity in the midst of their differences. Remember who's writing this. It's the Apostle Paul. Well, probably about 20 years before he wrote this letter, he was persecuting to the point of death early Christians. This man changed. Christ changed this man. And today we see how he chooses to end. This is the last letter he wrote to this church that he was worried about. The last letter. And we see what he says to them. And he sounds a lot like Jesus, exhorting the members of the church to examine themselves, to go inside themselves. Paul is lifting up a kind of self-vigilance, which is the opposite of casually, casually indulging our angers. Paul's goal he has a lot of goals, but, but this one seems especially clear that he wants to find ways for the people, he says this, for them to agree with one another, to live in peace, to build up, not to tear down. This is a picture of harmony in a church where harmony was hard to come by. And then Paul ends with his great benediction. It's the end of the reading. It's the end of... 2 Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The Trinity. Hard to understand. The Trinity. One way in seminary, and I'd never heard this before seminary, that we talked about the Trinity, and it made sense to me at a minimum, symbolically. We talked about it in something called the social analogy of the Trinity. And it's the idea that God, as an example for us, lives in community in a kind of internal self-diversity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in perfect harmony, three in one. Jesus and Paul, both today, are addressing the challenge of human beings living in community. Communities in which differences very often cause anger, which can, as we know, from the very beginning of the Bible and from the news today and every day, can become seeds of violence. Friends, we live in a time when it seems there are a lot of hot, of hot button issues, which people really get angry about. And the message from this sixth commandment and from Jesus and from Paul and from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the message is that we'd better learn how to deal with this anger and find ways to reconcile as individuals and as a society before things get out of control. It's a serious message for serious times, as relevant today as at the very beginning of the Bible, and a very, very American message as we strive 
to be a more perfect union.